Well, Merry Christmas. I know that you all want to join me as you think about what went into that. Like we come and sit and just get to listen and enjoy, of course, sing along. Uh, it's not lost probably on any of us if you think about it, though, the amount of time that this team put into it. So would you guys join me in thanking our worship pastor, Seth Condry, every band member, every singer. The whole, yep, every singer, David. I got them already. Well, I do want to say Merry Christmas. I want to say Merry Christmas for those of you who are part of our Epic Church community, uh, whether you're here in the room, and the room is full, and that's fun. If you didn't know that, a number of people have said this to me tonight as they came in, and we said Merry Christmas, that we anticipate this being our last Christmas Eve in this space, because over the last year, we bought a space at 414 Brandon, and we're really believing, hoping, and praying, and you can join us in praying that we will be in that space next year. It's got way more space. Trying to dream about what could we do? Hot cocoa, carolers, photo ops, I don't know, but um, Merry Christmas, and if you're a guest tonight, you are here because someone invited you. Uh, Maybe you're here with your kids, or you're here with your parents. I just want to say welcome to Epic. We really believe, even if you're a one-and-done person, or you thought you were one and done coming in tonight, we think you can experience home right here in this setting tonight. And so whatever your story is, um, I hope that you have a sense of home while you're here. Speaking of home, how many of you have ever done a home exchange? Just keep your hands up high. A home exchange, I'll tell you what it means in a little bit, but if you don't know, you probably haven't. (laughs) Keep them up high if you've ever done a home exchange. Okay, Not a lot of us, maybe five or six. Um, Raise your hand if you've never done a home exchange, but you've seen the movie The Holiday that's all about a home exchange. Way more hands go up. Okay. Well, if you've done one, you know, and if you've seen the movie, you might know, but a home exchange is where you go and stay in someone else's home while they come and stay in your home. And I know some of you are like, not, some, anybody just saying not me already? Like you just, nope, not going to do it. I've got a friend, Ben Lee, over here to my left, and they're just like, Ben, why in the world would I ever go stay in a stranger's home? And even worse, why would I ever allow a stranger to stay in my home? Truth? Anybody like that in the camp with Ben Lee? Like, nope, we're not doing it. I know Jesus said something about hospitality, but that is too, that is too far. Well, we wanted to take our first family trip to Europe in 2018, and we thought the most affordable way to do that was to do a home exchange. And some of you are like, no, just pay extra. (laughs) Or you're like, just go to Arizona, right? You don't have to do a home exchange to take a trip. And we literally joined as members homeexchange.com that year, 2018. And if you've not done it, which is most of you, what you do is you create a profile, you put pictures of your home, and you put the city that you live in. Now, pro tip, if you live in San Francisco, a lot of people want to come to San Francisco, or at least they did in 2018. I think they still want to come. And, and so what you do is you begin to kind of put, here's the month we want to travel, here's the area we're willing to go to, wherever it is around the world, and, and here's when our home would be available. And so what happens is you start receiving inquiries, and you start making requests. And it took us weeks to do this, but after several weeks, we finally had a match. And we matched up with a family in Paris, and we're like, we will take that. There were lots of places where, like, the timing's not going to work. Other places were like, we're not going to tell you this, but we would never go there, right? And finally, we had a family from Paris who wanted to come to San Francisco. And so, in July of 2018, our family flew out of SFO Airport at the same time that that family was flying out of Charles de Gaulle in Paris. And so we somehow passed each other in the air. We get to Paris... And we were so far from home, and of course, that was quite evident by the length of time it took us to fly over there, but it was evident in other ways that we were far from home. Uh, It was evident in the sense that uh, the appliances in their house, they they, they weren't exactly like the appliances in our house. You ever experienced that in a foreign place? And it wasn't even as intuitive as I thought it would be. Uh, Most of the books on that family's bookshelves were not written in a language that we could read. And then I remember when someone in our family needed some medicine, and I'm your guy. I just I love fixing things. I love fixing people. If you're here tonight and need fixing, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm here for it. I thought, I'll just go down to the local pharmacy, and I will get the medicine that's needed for someone in, in our family. Now, has anyone ever gone to a foreign pharmacy, thought, I'll figure out what I need, even though I don't speak the language, and I'm sure it will be exactly what I need to get? I think no one in the family that I bought that for has died, so I think we got close <laughs> to the medicine that they needed 
But it was really clear to me while we were there that our family of six, we were, we were so far from home. And yet, while the six of us were there for the week, we would all say we experienced a deep sense of home. And you should ask the question, how is that possible? How can you simultaneously be so far from home and at the same time experience such a deep sense of home? Well, here's how it's possible. For starters, what we all know is this, home is a place. When I say the word home, I'm curious which place comes to your mind. Is it the house that you grew up in or the apartment that you grew up in or is it your grandmother's house? I really want you to think about what is it that comes when you just hear the word home, especially for this time of year as we think about Christmas Eve, like what is it that comes to your mind? Maybe it's your home here or a home that you spent your formative years in, or maybe it was the first home you had or the home that you hoped to have, but home is a place, and absolutely that's true, but it's way more than that, isn't it? Home is also this. Home is a person, and so the reason that I could be in Paris with my family and all of us have some deep sense of home while being really far from home in a foreign place is because we were together. Do you know what it's like to be in a new place that's pretty foreign, but to have your people and everything be okay? It's why I could be in Uganda on a mission trip with one of my sons and still feel at home, though we were thousands of miles from here. It's why I can be hiking in a forest with my entire family in who knows where. We've never been before, and we can feel at home. It's why my friends and I can go to London, and we realize we're far from home, but because we're together and telling the same jokes, and they're laughing about me at the same time for the same reason, we still have a sense of, of home. It's why here at Epic we talk often about believing that this is a community and a place where you can find home. And the truth is, if you don't know much about our church, is most of us are very far from our original homes, and yet so many of us have found a deep sense of home right here. And maybe the least likely places we expected to find it. And so as we think about this idea of home for Christmas, this Christmas Eve message, I, I wonder if it's possible for you, no matter what your story is or the circumstances surrounding your idea of home, I wonder if it's possible for you to find home this year. No matter how far you are from it, and no matter if you've lost your sense of home. One of the very interesting things that you may not know is that what happens with leading a church in San Francisco is different than what happens in 99% of churches in America. Do you know this? There's a lot of differences, but on Christmas Eve, I'm talking about. What's different about Christmas Eve in 99% of churches, so when I'm texting all my pastor friends this week, and they're like, guys, praying for your perseverance because I know you've got 14 services. I'm like, I'm not responding. I don't even want them to know. I'm doing it. Because in places, really, there's only a few places, uh, downtown San Francisco, kind of the urban core here, as well as Manhattan and New York, those would be two of the few places where um, we're the only cities and leading churches in the only cities where you don't do more services for Christmas, you do less. And so I know I shouldn't even get a whole paycheck in December. I totally, totally get it. Um, so what we know already is that so many people in our community, they're already home. In fact, there are fewer people, if you don't count tourists, there are fewer residents in San Francisco this week than any other week of the entire year, which is pretty fascinating. So we know that many of you in our community are watching this in some other city in California or in some other state in the U.S. as well as places around the world. So we want to make sure they feel included, don't we, if you're here in the room? So we're going to give the loudest Merry Christmas when I count to three, okay? I want you to give a Merry Christmas that's so loud that people, wherever they are around the world, and you're thinking it's probably cooler where they are than where we are. Not like cooler and like hip, but just like cooler. You should have the lights on you. And so on three, we're going to go Merry Christmas as loud as we can so that people, wherever they're watching, anywhere around the world, they will hear us, okay? Are we good? One, two, three. Merry Christmas. That was so strong. I think they heard you wherever they may be watching this from. But we're here for Christmas, aren't we? And there's all kinds of reasons that we're here for Christmas. We have college students, if you don't know, from all over the world who are part of our community here, and they are spending, San Fran they're spending Christmas in San Francisco. Any college students here tonight? We love you. We love that you're here. We love that you're spending your Christmas in San Francisco. There are other people here still for Christmas because um, they have to work here. And contrary to what you all think, not every one of us can work remotely, can we? It's hard for doctors to do their job remote. Some of you are like, no, Ben, I figured it out. I've got a teledoc. All good. Um, it's hard for janitors to do their job remotely. 
It's hard for baristas to do their job remotely. It should be hard for pastors to do their job remotely. So some of you are here because you're working. Uh, Others of you are here because it's just an affordability issue. It's always expensive to travel, but isn't it even more expensive to travel at Christmas? And so some of you are like, yeah, Ben, I don't care, man. We're here for Christmas, but in January when the flights go down, we are off. Great. So there's all kind of reasons that make a lot of sense, but for some of you, the reason you're here this Christmas, the reason goes much deeper. For some of you, the person that represented home for you is no longer alive, and you don't have a home to go back to. For some of you, you're now estranged from your family, and um, they don't want you to come home. For others of you, there's something painful that you've experienced between last Christmas and this Christmas, and it just doesn't make sense for a lot of reasons for you to go home. And let's be honest, some of you could have gone home, but you wanted to spare yourself the drama and the conflict and the shame that comes whenever you show up at home. I'm curious... What if the point of Christmas is to show us where to find our true home? No matter where you come from, no matter what you think when you hear the word home, and no matter if you've lost all sense of home. Many of you know that first Christmas story. Joseph is essentially betrothed or engaged to be married to Mary, and he gets word that Mary is pregnant. He knows that that child could not belong to him. And he makes a plan to divorce Mary quietly. But while he's considering that, listen to what goes down in Matthew 1, verses 20 through 21. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, that's Joseph, in a dream, and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Did you notice what the angel said to Joseph? Do not be afraid to take Mary home. And when the angel told Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary home, do you think he had a structure in mind? Do you think he had his childhood home in mind or her childhood home in mind? He didn't mean that at all. He didn't mean home is in a place. He meant home is in a person. And the angel is saying on God's behalf, Joseph, Mary really is your person. And and, and as a unit, as making home, you're going to bring home into the world. It had been prophesied some 700 years prior by Isaiah, and in Isaiah 7, 14, we read, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel, the God of the universe, coming to be with us, coming to make his home where we make our home. Because of the census, you may know this, but because of the census, Mary and Joseph have to go to Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is about 90 miles from Nazareth. And when they get to Bethlehem, they can't even find room in the inn. You might know that part. So they don't even have a temporary home. And I don't know about you, but let me ask you, isn't it ironic that Mary and Joseph can't even find a temporary home to deliver the eternal home into the world? Isn't it fascinating that that they can't even find uh, like temporary shelter to deliver the eternal home, Emmanuel, God with us in to the world. Now, if you don't know much about the Bible, I'm so glad that you're here. If you know a lot about the Bible, you may not recognize what I'm about to tell you. It's fascinating what the four gospel writers do with the Christmas story. So the four gospels, I mean, some of you are like, hey, I haven't been to church in a minute, but I grew up in church. I know the four gospels. We're going to say them in order. You ready? Matthew. It's fascinating what all four of them do with the Christmas story. Let me tell you what Mark does with the Christmas story. Not a thing. I don't know if he's Scrooge-like or what, but Mark gives you nothing about Christmas in, in, in his entire gospel. Not a thing. Matthew gives you the Christmas story through Joseph's perspective. Luke gives you the Christmas story through Mary's perspective. And so Matthew and Luke, they give us the what of Christmas, but I believe it's the gospel writer John who gives us the why of Christmas. So Luke and Matthew, they're telling us about Joseph and Mary. They're telling us about shepherds and stars and glory to God in the highest and magi bringing these gifts. But John is going to tell us why the shepherds and why Joseph and why Mary. And I want you to see this really as the main text for us this Christmas Eve. John chapter 1, verse 9 through 14. John's giving us, remember, not the what, no events here. He's giving you the big idea of Christmas, though. John writes, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. 
He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. I began this message by telling you that our family did a home exchange. But as I think about what John's telling us, we should ask the question, why in the world would Jesus do a home exchange? I mean, for a lot of us, right, if we did a home exchange, we would be able to upgrade from one home to the next, but there's no upgrade opportunity for Jesus because for all of eternity, he has been on a throne. That's his place. Home is a place, but home is also a person. And though it's hard for us to get our minds around it, he's also been with his people, God the Father and God the Spirit, and he is God the Son. Why in the world would he take on flesh? Why in the world would he limit himself? Why would he become what we are? Why would he show up in the most fragile and completely dependent tiny little body? I love how Eugene Peterson translates The first part of verse 14, he says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. The the word became Jesus himself. He became flesh and blood and he moved into our neighborhood. And here's what John's telling us. He's telling you tonight and telling me that the light that came into the world is sufficient for everyone. Isn't that good news? He's saying he's sufficient for the Jews and he's sufficient for the Gentiles. He's sufficient for the old and he's sufficient for the young. He's sufficient for every man and he's sufficient for every woman. He's sufficient for the very religious and he's sufficient for the irreligious. Aren't you grateful that he's sufficient? And though he's sufficient for everyone, he came to his own. He came to his home. He came to his hometown and so many In the place that he called home, so many of those people refused to recognize him, and they outright rejected him. But to everyone who would receive him, to those who believed in his name, who placed their faith in Jesus, he gave them the highest privilege known among humans, that great high privilege of becoming a son or a daughter of the Most High God. And we read about that and we think that's history, but I'm here to tell you if no one else has so far today that he's coming here tonight. And the choices that these two groups of people made, they're really the only two choices we get to make tonight with what we hear about Jesus. And I'm curious what you might decide. I'm curious if this would just be a nice Christmas Eve service where the music was great, the message was bearable, we lit the candles, and then we got to food and presents. Or if this could be the night where you find the home you've been searching for your entire life. Or maybe this would be the night when you come back home. All of those who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. Or to say it another way, Jesus made his home with us so we could make our home with him. I love to ask questions. If you know me and my teaching style, you know that. So let me just give you a few of us some questions tonight, or all of us a few questions tonight. The the first one is this. What sense of home have you lost? It can happen for all kinds of reasons. Death of a family member, divorce, you're no longer living where you used to live, you're not going on the trip you used to take this time of year, but what sense of home have you lost? The second question is a different one, but it's as important where are you searching for home? Is it in your profession? Is it in your relationships? Is it in amassing great wealth? Where are you saying to yourself, if I get that, if I have that, if I go there, if I'm with her, if I'm with him, then I'll have the thing that will finally make me feel like I've found home. I love this from Henry Nouwen. In his book, Following Jesus, when he talks about how we think we're going to find home somewhere, and we just keep kind of anxiously going for it. Here's what he writes. He writes, if we don't have an anchor, we run around anxiously. Anybody know that? Nervously doing things. But there's no place of home. If we don't have a sense of at-homeness, there is no joy in moving. There's no joy. There's no sense in going to find it out there if we don't find it right here. 
And the third question I want to ask you is, is it time to come home? Could it, could it be possible that you need to come home? You probably know this, but perhaps the greatest parable Jesus ever told was about a father who had two sons, and the youngest son said to his dad, can I have your inheritance? I know you're still alive, but I would really love to go do some things with myself and try to find the meaning of life. And the father says yes, and so this younger son, he sets off for, the text says, a distant country, and as he's in a distant country, his aim is to get as far away from his father's home as possible, and he just goes seeking and searching. I mean, he's got lots of wealth. He's trying to do all the things he couldn't do before that he thought he was restricted from in his father's home. And after all of his searching and all of his seeking, he literally comes up empty. And what does he say? Even if you're not a church person, you may know that I'm going to go back. Now listen closely so you don't miss what I'm about to say. When he determines, the text says he comes to his senses and he determines to go back home. When he says, I'm going back home, he literally and only means a place. Are you with me? He only means a place. All he's thinking about is his father's home, the place, the structure, the land. And he's thinking, maybe I'll go back and get a job there, at least as an employee in my father's home, his estate, his physical estate. I will at least be able to eat what I cannot eat right now. I'm going home, but home in his mind was not a person. Yeah, ben, why do you think that? Because when, that, when, when he left the way that he left, his, his father would rightfully disown him, or really he would have been the one walking out. So when he's going, I'm going to take off for home, he simply means a place. But when he gets back, he finds out what I pray you would find out tonight, that home, yes, it's a place, but it is more than that. Home is a person. Luke 15, 20, so he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Some of you are convinced because you've been gone so long that if you were to come home to your faith in Jesus, that you're just not sure how disappointed and how bad it would go for you. And what Jesus is telling this story to let you know is, in the most extravagant way possible, God is ready to welcome you home. He's not happy enough because you're in the structure of a church home. He wants you to gain home or regain home in him tonight. For the first time ever this week, Shauna and I had the privilege of welcoming home one of our own children. First time ever. Our oldest went away to college early September and uh, Monday night with all of us at the airport, including the dog. He came home. And here's what I want to tell you. When he came to our home, the one he had only left three and a half months ago, it didn't look like the home he left. His room, you're going to think I'm a bad dad now. That's not, I'm okay with that. His room is no longer his room. The furniture we had when he left, we don't have it all still. He may have slept on the couch this entire week. But I think if you were to have a conversation with him after this service was over, he would tell you that I've experienced a deep sense of home. Because, yes, home is a place. But home is our people, right? And what Jesus came into the world to do is to bring so much light that no matter how foreign a place you find yourself in, metaphorically or physically, you can still have home. You can still have home. I've interacted with many of you as you're coming in tonight. I've met people who are in San Francisco because circumstances brought them here. I know some of you are here with family. Others of you don't have anywhere else to go. The beautiful reality of what's true in our church, but what's true in God's kingdom is that this is for the rich and the poor. It's for those of us with the biggest home and for those of us that are unhoused. It is for those of us that moved in last week and those have been in our same house for two decades. It is for those of us who feel comfortable in a church and weren't sure we were ever going to show back up, but we came tonight and you're here. And I want to remind you that the light of Jesus is sufficient for everyone. And I don't know everyone's story, so I don't know what the circumstances are surrounding your idea of home. But I do know that Jesus came to offer you this grand invitation. And I think here's his invitation tonight as I sense it from the Holy Spirit right now. Come home. No matter how far you've gone. 
come home. No matter how long you've been away, I know it's unfamiliar now. Come home. The, the best day for you to have come home was yesterday, but the next best day is this day. And it's available to you. But you've got to know that the light that was sufficient for the whole world, there were two groups of people. And it wasn't like, oh, the light came for some of them, and it didn't come for all of them. Let me tell you what was said. The true light that gives light to everyone. If tonight you're ready to come home to Jesus, what better gift to yourself this Christmas than the one he wants to give you by saying, welcome home. Others of you, maybe this is the first time you've been in church in a long time, and I want to say the return home invitation is such a reality and a possibility for you. But there are two groups of people. There's a group of people in this room, just like we read about in John 1. There's a group of people watching online right now. And in and, and this first group, it's a group of people that we just, you, you refuse to recognize him. You refuse to acknowledge that he could be everything you've been searching for. You, you refuse to believe that a God could be that good, that could, he could create you, he could show up into your world, know what it's like to be you, go to the cross for you so that you could be different and find an eternal home with him forever. But you can reject that. You can refuse to recognize him. Or you could be in that second group, the group that received Jesus, found home in Jesus, believed or put their faith in Jesus, and receive the highest privilege of becoming a son or daughter of the Most High God. Would you guys just pray with me? I'm going to just ask a couple of questions, pray for you, and then we'll sing a little bit more, light our candles, and be on our way. But I don't want us to miss this moment. The light has come into the world. And you can fail to recognize Jesus as such. But my encouragement would be that you would receive him and place your faith in him. And I would love to just help you experience the sense of welcome home from Jesus. If that's you, I would love just to lead you in a prayer. You can lift a hand just so I know who I'm praying for. And I'd love to just pray for you. If you would say tonight, I want to come home by placing my faith in Jesus. You can simply say this, Jesus, I want you to make your home in me as I make my home in you. For others of you, it's not that you've never had faith, it's just that it hasn't been active and present for a while. You moved to a new city, you went through something difficult, you got busy at work, and you just didn't make time for it. And I want you to know there's so much grace here for you, but the invitation's the same. Come home. And you can just say to Jesus, Jesus, I want to receive that invitation to return home. To return home. And Jesus, I pray that as your light has shone into the darkness, I pray that your light would shine into the hearts of every boy and girl and man and woman here tonight. Thank you that your light is sufficient for the darkest dark. Thank you that no matter what our past is, because of who you are and the light that comes in, you can turn a dark past into a very bright future. And I pray that would be experienced all over this room tonight. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Go ahead and stand. And while it's true that these candles are going to be a beautiful scene in this room and we should take pictures for sure, I want to make sure we don't miss the point based on what we've heard tonight. So, so here's what's going to go down. I'm going to light my candle. And here's what I'm going to do. As I light my candle, I'm going to remind myself that his light is sufficient for me. And as I light some candles of friends here and we begin to light each other's candles, I want you to remind yourself that his light is sufficient for you. I don't care how dark it is. And I want you to remind yourself to know that his light is sufficient for your entire family. Even the member of your family you think, I don't know, will ever be reconciled. God's light is sufficient for that person. His light is sufficient for our entire Epic Church community. Those of us here between these four walls and those of us watching all over the world, his light is sufficient. And no matter what we might see and hear 
and feel about our city at times, do you believe that his light is sufficient for our whole city? And the light that's sufficient for our whole city, it is indeed sufficient for the whole world. And you're going to get some beautiful melodies from this guy as we remind ourselves his light is sufficient for every single one of us. Thank you.